You know, last week we began a series called Ten to Life where we're taking the Ten Commandments and we're looking at them through a different lens, the lens that God actually intended them to be looked at. See, the problem is, is so often we look at the Ten Commandments as legalistic laws that are meant to enslave us in life. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of enslaving laws around us. One One of the biggest enslaving laws, in my opinion, is that stupid thing called a speed limit. There should be no speed limit. We should be able to go as fast as we want all the time. That's just my opinion, amen? <laughs> Whoa, y'all need to slow down. Don't be, don't be driving crazy now. You know, there's so many crazy laws. Last week I shared some with you, and some of you looked at me like I was crazy because I informed you, many of you didn't know, that it is completely legal. I'm new to Tennessee. I didn't know this. But in Tennessee, it is completely legal to get roadkill off the side of the road, take it home, and consume it. Other states, that's illegal. But not in Tennessee, bless God. Go Vols. We can eat roadkill. How many of you have eaten roadkill? Raise your hand. I got my hand up. Raise your hand. That's it? Oh, my goodness. I'm back in the south. I figured that was normal down here. I, I've eaten roadkill. Armadillas? No? Hey, we're going to be having a potluck dinner at the church next week. Come be a part of that. Got some surprises for you. Man, I could tell you all some stories. You know, last week I shared with you that many of you may not know that if you steal somebody's horse in Tennessee, it's punishable by hanging. If you have more than eight women that live in your house at any given time, it's illegal because it's considered a brothel just because they live there. So some of you need to move some people out, it sounds like. Tennessee has got some crazy laws, and in fact, we live under these laws, and of course, most of these laws are not enforced, but let's be honest, all around us, laws are being added upon uh, upon us time and time again. We've got executive orders being passed left and right. I'm not going to get into that. We don't want to talk politics today. But there's law after law after law that is mounted upon us, and it's created this mentality that we feel weighed down and in bondage in so many, so many ways. See, laws have that ability that they can either be liberating or enslaving. Why don't you write that down? Laws can be liberating or they can be enslaving. Laws can liberate you just like the law of being able to eat roadkill in Tennessee. For some of you, you may feel liberated by that, in which case you probably need help. For some of you, you may feel enslaved by some of the other laws that are placed upon us. And you know what? The Ten Commandments are no different. Most people, unfortunately, see these as laws that are enslaving, that put us in bondage. They've been fought about, argued over, debated on constantly. Some people call them the Big Ten, the do's and don'ts of Christianity. Some people refer to them as the Ten Great Suggestions. I believe they're the foundation of the church, but yet others believe they're hang-ups. In this series, we're going to dive into the Ten Commandments and look how they're really meant to not enslave us, but to to liberate us, to liberate us in the way that God created them to. And if you have your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 20. Let me give you a little bit of a backstory while you turn there. Obviously, it's not going to be on the screen this week. So let me give you a little bit of a backstory on the on, on the Ten Commandments. See, the, the Israelites, if you will, were, were God's people, and, and there was a famine. So Joseph, who had been sold into slavery by his brothers, ended up living in Egypt. And while in Egypt, he goes through all these years of of torment, if you will, going through trials and testing in order to become the man that God created him. And as Joseph grows, he gains favor with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he gets them through this huge famine. In doing so, there was a relationship that was started. And Pharaoh allowed Joseph's family, 70 individuals, to come and live with him in Egypt. Well, after 430 years, that 70 people group had turned into millions of people, and unfortunately, pharaohs had changed power in such a way that the pharaoh now no longer had a friendly relationship with the Israelites. They were now enslaved to Egypt. And the Israelites had, and and sadly enough, had been enslaved for so long that they no longer knew what it meant to be free. That entire generation, multiple generations, had died off to where now all that was left was people that had never experienced anything but slavery. Millions and millions of people. Well, God rises up a remnant named Moses who, who, is, who is saved from the, the torturous ki- killing that uh, Pharaoh enacted on the people. And Moses rises up and he builds, a, he builds this stamina and this stature within, in, the, in the group of Egypt until he kills one of the Israelites. He flees out into the wilderness. Y'all still with me? Say amen. 
Okay, he flees into the wilderness where he meets God in a burning bush moment. And God tells him, I want you to go deliver my people. So God sends Moses into Egypt and he goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And the Moses, and I'm sorry, Pharaoh, all these names, I'm going so fast. Pharaoh goes, no. So God sends all these plagues and Pharaoh's heart gets hardened and hardened, harder and harder and harder until he finally releases the people. They cross over the Red Sea. It's opened up. Pharaoh's people go in, it closes on them, they all die, and now the Israelites are finally free to wander around the wilderness for 40 years in total chaos. Because, see, something happened. They came out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of them. What happened is you've got millions of people that are walking around in a desert that have known nothing but structure and enslavement for all these years. They know nothing different, and now Moses is in charge of leading them. Well, Moses takes a break, and he goes up on Mount Sinai, and he says, I need to meet with God. And I believe it's a twofold reason. One reason, I believe, is because he was dealing with people, and he needed it to get away from them. Anybody ever met somebody you need to get away from? How about a million people you needed to get away from? You know, I can, I can almost imagine, because I, I pastor a church that when everybody's here on a Sunday, we have, you may not know this, around two to 215 people in our church right now. Praise God. What, God has done some awesome things this year. So when everybody's here, we have a church of about 215 people. And I can tell you this as a pastor of a church of about 200 some odd people, that sometimes people get on your nerves. Because what happens, people start rubbing up against people. And we have a good church. There's really very little complaining. I've been to some churches that make you just want to burn it down. But, you know, the truth is people are people, and you're going to have people that complain. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like the music. I don't like the pastor. He looks funny. Y'all don't know the truth. I don't look funny. I look good, Jesus told me. And the reality is people complain, and they get on each other's nerves, and they whine, and you just kind of want to go, ah. I'm going to go hang out on the mountain with Jesus. Now, I look at Moses, who had millions of people that are hot, stanky, don't have any really good food to eat. They're wandering around lost. And what happens when a million people are hot, stinky, hungry, and lost? They get ornery. And so you've got all these Israelites getting ornery. So Moses says, I got to get away from y'all. Y'all can call it spiritual if you want. But I think it was Moses' way of saying, listen, I got to leave before I hurt y'all. So Moses leaves, he gets on the mountaintop, but I also believe there's another reason. Because, see, he was leading a group of people that did not understand law. What they understand is, do what the Pharaoh says or you'll be beaten. Do what you're told or you will die. They didn't understand what it meant to have self-structure. All they understood was enslavement. So Moses was drawn up to the mountaintop to hear from God, and this is what God tells them in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandment one. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Second commandment. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Let me stop right there. See, like I said earlier, laws can either be liberating or enslaving. And many, unfortunately, see the Ten Commandments as being a list of do's and don'ts that we have to live by, a bar to live up to. In fact, the the Jewish people have taken the Ten Commandments and they've turned them into 613 laws that all build upon the commandments and in many ways complicate it. But in their purest form, there's these ten live-by rules of do's and don'ts in order to keep us and protect us. You know, one of the ways I like to look at it, I used this analogy last week, but I need to use it again because it doesn't get better than this. If you have a child and they live in in your home, I have three little boys, and, 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 and I'm going to be honest, we don't tell our kids it's okay to run around in the road and chase cars. That's a no-no in our house. And if you've ever had small children, you probably understand the need of putting a fence up, don't you? Because you don't want your kids to run out and get hit by a car. At our home, we have an underground fence, and we put shock collars on our kids so they can't go past the line. That's, that's okay, right, in Tennessee? No, no, bad idea? Okay. Please don't call the police. I am kidding. There are no shock collars on my kids. 
If they made them small enough you couldn't see them, I would think about it, though. But at our house, I have older boys, so in our house, we don't have a fence up any longer. But what we do have is we have some markers in our yards. We say that you cannot go past that stop sign, you cannot go past that house, and you can play within these boundaries. Those boundaries are set to where at any point, mama can look out the window and see what trouble our kids are getting into, amen? We can look and see if they're in the creek, if they're, if they're drowning, if they're catching tadpoles, if they're throwing rocks. We can see within the boundaries, and we tell them that you have freedom within these boundaries. Just don't go out. So have we enslaved our kids to the yard? Absolutely not. We've liberated them. We have said, just don't go out of those boundaries, and you have the freedom to learn and to grow within these boundaries. Is there still things that can happen negatively? Absolutely. I told you we have these boundaries at our house. I look out the window the other day, have to roll up the window and go, hey, quit it. Why? Because my boys are in the yard attacking a tree. They have gotten tools out of the yard, and they are attacking a tree. They're supposedly building a fort by stabbing the tree with a uh, yard tools. I don't really understand it, but they're destroying the tree in the yard. So it was an opportunity to teach them. See, I would rather teach within the boundaries than lose them outside of the boundaries. And that's what the Ten Commandments are. They're they're boundary lines that doesn't set us up for perfection, but it protects us from going so far out of the boundary lines that in many cases we go too far. They're boundary lines to liberate us in order to learn life lessons from within the circle. They liberate, not enslave. And with all that being said, last week we looked at the first commandment, the first two commandments, have no other gods before me and build no idols. See, the first two commandments set up to the, the rest of the commandments by setting up God as our priority. Write that down. God as our priority. Commandment one and two is all about God is our priority. Put nothing above him. Put nothing even close to being above him. See, in the biblical times when God is saying this to Moses, he understands that the those that lived in that day and time that there were literally thousands upon thousands of gods worshipped by neighboring cultures. So when God says, do not put any other gods before me, he's speaking directly to something they understand. See, they had the Asherah, they had the Leviathan, they had Baal. And given we don't walk down the street and see, we don't see people in our, in our neighborhoods building up these, these giant monuments to other gods and bowing down to them. We don't, we don't see people put up an Asherah pole and lift up their children to it and worship. We don't see that today. The gods, may, the gods' names may have changed, but the idols have not. See, the Asherah represented the God of pleasure. How many of you know we see people put pleasure above God all the time? The God of Leviathan is the God of chaos. We see people that chase drama and chaos all the time. We see people that worship the God of Bel. They may not call it Bel, but Bel is simple, simply master. Things that they lift up above God. Things, maybe addictions, or maybe it's their own desires. In fact, Bel is simply just me. It's what I want. It's what I need. And, and that is placed above God so many times. So God starts out by saying, listen, if you want to see the boundary lines that will liberate you, simply don't put anything above me. Keep me number one. Well, commandments three and four are a little bit different. See, three and four are all about living healthy. Why don't you write that down? Commandments three and four are all about living healthy. Let me read them to you again. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When we're talking about living healthy, we're talking about the full package. We're talking about the complete package, not just physically healthy. We're talking about being healthy in our mind, our body, and our soul. Being healthy in our mind, our body, and our soul. Write that down this morning. Healthy in our mind, body, and soul. Why does God want us healthy in all of those? Because God created us to walk in his fullness. So let's break it down. Let me explain to you how God wants us to be healthy. See, he gives us commandment number three. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. See, in vain means a couple important things. So often we lock it into just one simple thing. But using the name of the Lord in vain means a number of things. Number one, it means do not use his name in a useless way. Do not use his name in a useless way. That's the one that most of us recall. I don't know about you, but I grew up with a grandmama that would snatch me up by the ear. Whoo! And I, I, I didn't give my heart to Christ until, until I was in high school. But, but I tell you this, grandmama always made sure I was in church. 
always. And if I ever, if I ever walk by my grandmother and say, well, for Christ's sake, let me tell you something. My, my grandmama has, I've never heard her cuss. I've never heard her, seen her hit anything. But my grandmama would have knocked my teeth out of my head. And she would have told me. She would have said, Jeremy, that is using God's name in vain. That is using Jesus' name in vain. But friends, it's not just in the word. It's in the attitude. See, the reason God doesn't want us to use his name in a useless way is because we get desensitized to it. When Jesus' name is just any other name, we get desensitized to it like a child that plays video games or watches certain movies that desensitizes them to life. We can become desensitized to the name of Jesus. And the Word of God tells us that there is power in the name of Jesus. He doesn't want us to use his name in a useless way because our mentality changes towards it. Our attitude changes. And we forget that there's power in that name. There's salvation in that name. There is healing in that name. There is hope in that name. But when we toss his name around as if it has no value, we lower lower the value in our own minds as well. We become desensitized. The Bible also tells us that using the name of of God in vain can affect other areas of our life. Like number two, don't use his name to lie. Now most of us here surely would never do that, but I think we all have. I I think we've all lied before. Any any other liars in the house? Let me see your hands. All the liars in the house, put your hands in the air. You liars, you're lying right now. You've all lied. If you haven't lied, you're a liar. And if you have lied, you're a liar. We're, we're born as liars. We, we learn how to lie. Small. Did you do that? Uh-uh. It's in your hand. I didn't do it. I see it in your hand. It's not me. Come on, if you've ever had kids, you know what I'm talking about. We're all liars. But so many times we've, 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 we've found ourselves putting God's name on a lie. Well, I promised to Jesus I didn't do it. I promised to God it didn't happen. When he says don't use his name in vain, he's also saying do not use his name in order to justify or solidify a lie. There is no white lie. There's no black lie. There's just lying. And any time we put God's name on a lie, we've used his name in vain. Maybe that's not a big one in your life. Maybe that's not one you struggle with very much. But I bet you number three we've all done recently. See, number three is do not use his name for vanity. Vanity is, we get that, name, that word from the word vain. Using Christ's name, using God's name for vanity. It's, see, God's not a piece of jewelry we put on to make us look better. People, people hide under this banner of being his child in order to make themselves feel better than other people. Friends, let me be very clear with you this morning. Just because you have given your heart to Christ, if you're here today and you've given your heart to Christ, it does not make you a better person than the biggest sinner out there. Just because you've given your life to him doesn't make you better than anybody else. It makes you saved. That's it. See, the reality is I'm just a filthy sinner like anybody else. All I really am is someone who has found the water and telling other lost people how to find the water because we're all just thirsty folks. And what God wants us to understand is any time that we use his name for vanity to make ourselves look better than others, to make ourselves hide under this banner of I've arrived, I've, I am something now because I've met Jesus, we have now used his name for vanity. We've used his name in vain. Let me give you another one that I think many times we do. It's do not use his name falsely. If we're going to keep from using his name in vain, that we have to understand that we cannot use his name falsely. What do you mean by that? Well, I want to teach you a word that we use in our house quite often. Are you all ready? Say God stamping. Say it together. God stamping. That's a word we use in our house a lot because we have found that in our lives as well as others around us that it's so easy to God stamp things. What do you mean? It's, well, it's like this. It's when we put God's name on things that he didn't put his own name on. It's when we say, well, this is what God wants me to do, and God never said that. I remember I was discipling a young man named Levi years ago. I had hired him to work at the church. He was one of the janitors at the church, and he came into my office and said, Pastor, I want you to mentor me. Will you, will you mentor me? I want to grow, and I, I'm a new believer, and I just need some help. And I'm like, yeah, sure. 
Well, for the next few weeks, he would come in my office and sit for 30 to 45 minutes at a time and tell me all the things that God verbally told him. And then one day, I just stopped him in mid-sentence, and I said, can I just tell you something? He said, yeah, Pastor. I said, listen, you are so spiritual, I shouldn't even be in your presence because you've heard the voice of God more than anybody in the Bible. And he looked at me like, oh, did you just say that? And I said, yeah, I just said that. In fact, let me tell you something. You are putting God's name on things that you want to happen. You're putting God's name on things that you think should happen. And you're giving God credit for things that he doesn't want credit for. What has God told you versus what have you told yourself? See, we've all done it. We've all been at a place that we have a job we want, so we say it's God. We, we all see something that we want to buy, and we may go, well, yeah, that's, that's a God thing. You know, I even we it's to a point now in our family we joke about it because I'll go to a, I'll go to the Harley store and I'll be like, I think God wants me to buy one today. Do you see the for sale sign? That is God's way of speaking to me. And I God stamp it. We we joke anytime there's a clearance sale and there's a clearance sign, it's God's way, a flashing sign that says, Time to go shopping. Come on, ladies, all the men are all the men want to say amen, but you're really scared right now. So let me just help you out. Amen, pastor. That's true. She sees that for sale sign, and God is all over it. Ladies, let me tell you something. Just because them shoes you want are 60% off does not mean God said buy them, okay? Don't put his name on that. We all have done it. We've all wanted something or hoped for something and longed for something so much that we say it's a God thing. In fact, maybe it looks a little bit different for you. Maybe it looks like this. See, in our house, we talk about the fact that everybody has a plate. You have a plate, and I have a plate. A plate in our lives that God puts things on. And you've heard that old statement, I'm trying to balance multiple plates in my life. Well, it's like this. See, God has given you a plate, and God will put things on the plate, and God will help you manage the things he puts on the plate. But what things go awry is when we put things on the plate and go, oh, God must want me to have this. God must want me to do this. And we take things and put them on our plate, and we God stamp it and say it's God's will. Friends, there are things in all of our lives that we have either bought, we have either done, or places that we have gone, or relationships that we have entered into that we have all at times in our life said, oh, it must be God. Putting God's name on things that God did not put his own name on is God stamping it, is using it falsely. Why does God say that? Why does God give us that, that commandment in order, in order to protect us, in order to give us a boundary to limit, uh, to not limit us, to uh, to uh, liberate us. Why does God give us that boundary? Because he understands that he will give you what he needs to give you. That he will open up the doors he wants to open. That we are not meant to push open those doors and run through them. We have to trust God. We have to allow him to open the door. See, healthy living is, is living out God's plans and priorities for our lives. Why don't you write that down? Healthy living is living out God's plans and priorities for our lives. Not our, not our plans that we throw his name needless upon. You know, the Bible says that a man orders, that a man plans his path, but the Lord determines his steps. So many times we have these plans for our lives. But God says, I've got something bigger for you. If you will live out my priorities, if you will live out the things that I have called for you and not what you want for yourselves, I will lead and direct you. The second commandment he gives us in order to live healthy, commandment number four in verse eight says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Everybody say holy. Oh, come on now. Help me out this morning. Everybody say holy. Holy. Let me tell you what holy means. Holy means set apart as sacred. Sacred is something very special. Sacred means that it has been appointed for such a time for greatness. It has been appointed for such a time as to be useful. It has been appointed for such a time to bring glory unto God. It is something set apart as sacred. That's what holy means. Now everybody say the word keep. Keep means to protect and guard at all cost. Another way of looking at that is as a father and as a husband, as the man of my home, I keep my family. That means I will guard and protect them at all costs. Break into my house and find out what that looks like. I will do whatever it takes to protect and keep and guard my family, whatever it takes. See, what the scripture says here is remember the Sabbath day to guard at all costs because it is set apart as sacred. Remember the Sabbath day and do whatever it takes to keep it sacred and set apart. Like all good rules, we should just shut up and do them, right? No. Sometimes we need to understand why the rules are there. 
Remember, the Ten Commandments are about freedom, not bondage. It's not God's way of saying, hey, take a day off or I'm going to strike you down with fire. There's a reason. It's not just about performing an act. It's not just about keeping the law. So how do we protect a day of rest in order to keep it sacred? Well, there's a key to it. It's not just taking a day off. It's not just calling the boss saying, I'm not coming in. It's not just calling the pastor saying, I'm not coming to church. We need to go to the lake. It's, it, that's not what it is. There's a key to keeping the Sabbath. The key is remembering. The key is remembering. Not in just doing, but in remembering. See, unfortunately, the Jewish culture has taken the Sabbath and made it so legalistic. There's all these rules of how many steps you can take a day, what you can carry, where you can go. It's not to, meant to be complicated. It's very simple. It's just remembering the Sabbath, doing whatever it takes because it's valuable. One of the things we need to remember is the how. How? How do you keep the Sabbath? How do you remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? Well, the key is work six, rest one. Work six, rest one. Now, I know if you look at our calendar, you see Sunday through Saturday. For many of us, we've built a culture where you work 40 hours a week, you take two days off. But I, I'm, not, I'm not here to step on toes. But I'm just going to be honest with you. The Bible doesn't say work 40 hours a week, take two days off. It doesn't say anything about retirement. Oh, and I know that, I know that may be a sore subject, but I need you to hear my heart this morning. The Bible doesn't say anything about going and working for the boss man for six days. It doesn't say that. It means to work, to labor, to create, to de develop, to make a difference in the world six days a week. Now, for some of you that may be working at a plant, for some of you may be working at your home, for some of you may be working in the community. And if you're retired today, I'm not saying that you've stepped out of the will of God and you're sinning by retiring from a job. No, not at all. Your job's just changed. You may not be working for the boss man 40 hours a week. Now it's time to do something different in order to labor, in order to make a difference in the world that God's placed you in. For some of you, that may be making phone calls six days a week. It may be working in a garden. It may be doing something in the community. It may be doing something with your church. Regardless of what it is, God says the key to the Sabbath is first work six days. Not, well, preacher, I put in five hours this week. That's enough work for me. For me. I just need to sit on the couch the rest of the time. No. He says, work. Well, pastor, that's not biblical. Yeah, it is. When God wants you to stop working, he takes you to a magical place called heaven. And until we're there, we are meant to labor on this earth six days a week. Now, as I'm your pastor, and I, people go, well, don't you, don't you just play golf every day? Well, yeah, normally. But then there's weeks like this week where I work six days a week, and I put in about 100 hours, it seems like. But regardless of what your week looks like, there has still got to be a day to rest. Not labor, whether it be physically or emotionally, but to simply rest. And that looks different for everybody. I remember I was cutting my grass on a Sunday years ago. I was a youth pastor at the time. And I'm cutting my grass. I live on a busy intersection. This, this older gentleman pulled up, put his car in park because he had something he had to say. Rolls down his window and begins to condemn me with scripture that was not even in the Bible. Some things he said were out of context. And starts telling me how I'm going to go to hell for cutting my grass on Sunday. Friends, let me just go ahead and tell you right now. If you swing by my house this, later th today, I'm going to be cutting my grass today. Why is that? Because the Sabbath is not just not doing anything physically. It's just a day of rest. And if you have a job where maybe six days a week you're working your mind at the church. I don't always build here. So I'm working my mind and my emotions greatly during the week. Well, my day of rest, I need to do something physical because that refreshes me. For some of you, maybe you have physical labor you do all throughout the week. Well, your day of rest may look like you read a book that you watch some TV, that you do something to just rest. Everybody's different. We're not here to make, make the Sabbath bondage and legalistic. We're here to look at the fact that it's to liberate us, to give us an opportunity to rest. First thing is remembering the how. The second thing is remembering the why. Remember the why. See, when we separate the law from the lawgiver, we lose context and purpose. See, there is a reason that God says, I want you to rest. Well, it's the same reason that he did. See, the Bible says that he took six days to create the earth, and then he rested on the seventh. Why did he rest on the seventh? Do you really think God was tired? Do you really think that God overdid it and had to take a break? Do you really think that God said, whoo, man, this is tough, creating the universe. I might need a nap. No. 
God rested for a reason. Number one, he wanted us to see how to do the process, but he also wanted us to understand the why. Because if we separate the, the, the lawgiver from the law, we miss context. So let's look at it and see why did God want us to rest? What is the why? Simply this, to reflect. God used his seventh day to reflect. We see that he does it some throughout the six days where he's created and said all the, it was all good. But then he takes the seventh day and he reflects on everything. See, the reason we're supposed to take the Sabbath, the reason we need a day of refresh, rest and refreshment is in order to reflect. Is in order to look on what God has done. Reflecting on all that he's done through us. If we never stop to reflect, we miss the chance to judge our work and appreciate the process. Have you ever had a time in a season where you didn't take a break? Where you just went and went and went and went? And then you went some more and went some more and went some more? Guys, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to just be vulnerable with you. Out of the Ten Commandments, the one that I struggle with the most is this one. Yesterday, was uh, Friday was my off day, and I put in 16 hours on my off day. I didn't rest. And you may sit there and go, well, doggone preacher, why are you preaching on it today? That's what I said. It's tough. And how many of you know that if you've ever been like me and you work and you work and you work and you give and you give and you give and you do and you do and you do, you end up getting emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted, don't you? You get to a point where your fuse is short. You get to a point where you feel like you're just a zombie walking around, and you feel like you're dying on the inside. But God says, that's why I want you to stop, because if you'll stop long enough to look back, you can appreciate the process and the journey that God's brought you on. You can judge and discern what you've done and what needs to be different next week, and you can take the time to refresh. See, refreshment only happens in the presence of God. And if we don't stop to reflect... We can never refresh. See, healthy living is living out God's plan of rest and refreshment. God wants you to stop and rest, and he wants you to reflect in order to refresh. I know that's a lot of R's. Let me, let me explain something to you with refreshment. Refreshment is not, I'm going to go play golf. Refreshment is not, I'm going to sit and watch TV. That's resting. Refreshment is not going and doing your hobby that, Puts a smile on your, fa your face. That's relaxing. Refreshment can only, hear me, can only happen in the presence of God. Refreshment can only happen when he's speaking to you. When you're spending time with him. When you're worshiping him. When you're in his word. When you're spending quality time with your heavenly father. It's the only time you can find refreshment. You can relax seven days a week if you have to. But it'll never refresh you. See, we get exhausted when we go, go, go and stop, never stop to take the Sabbath. Because number one, our body needs a break. But our spiritual, spiritual self needs refreshment. And God has designed us and created us in such a way, put up a boundary, not a legalistic boundary in order to keep us in bondage. No, he puts that boundary line to say, listen, I know how you are. I know you're a workaholic. I know that you're going to put in more hours than you need to. I know that you're going to spend all your time focusing on all this stuff. I need you to stop and just take a breath. And then I need you to stop and I need you to spend time with me. Let me refresh you. Let's reflect on all that is good so that you'll appreciate the process. I didn't plan on telling you this part, but let me just, let me tell you how that looks for me right now. I was talking to some people the other day that, um, that really minister to me personally. And I was talking about the fact that this year has been such a chaotic year of just go, go, go. Go, go, go. It's just always one thing after another. I mean, got it. Some of y'all are new and you just don't know. A year and a half ago, this church was about to get foreclosed on. We weren't paying our missionaries. We weren't blessing people. It was a mess. Nobody had gotten saved in years. And in this time, God has done some amazing things. Miraculous things. People's lives are being transformed. We're now sending money all over the world. God is doing amazing stuff. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm on that backside when my wheels are spinning and I look like a hamster in a rat trap. You know what I mean? Just 100 miles an hour. 
And in the midst of it, I've noticed something. I've become cynical. I've gotten frustrated. I've gotten exhausted and discouraged at times. And I'm just being honest and vulnerable with you. For me, it's because I never, I haven't taken the time. <sighs> All right, God, let's look at the details. Let's look at the process. Let me just hang out with you a little bit more. And let's, let's look at what's been done. See, sometimes if we're always looking at where we're headed and never stop to look at where God's brought us, we become cynical of where we're at. I don't know why I'm telling you that today. That's for somebody. I believe that. I believe there's people in this room that you've just gone and gone and gone. And life has been so busy that you haven't taken the Sabbath to rest and reflect and allow Him to refresh you. How many of you here are at a place where you just, you're unhealthy? I'm not just talking about physically. I mean, let's be honest. There's some of us that are physically unhealthy. I'm talking about you, you're at a place that maybe you're emotionally unhealthy, spiritually unhealthy. Maybe you're here and you've put some things on your plate that God didn't intend to be on your plate. You've taken a hold of opportunities. Maybe you've bought some things you shouldn't have. I'm not, I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to have nice stuff. Trust me, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that God doesn't want us to put his name on things that he didn't intend his name on. And God wants you to take time to rest also. Commandments 3 and 4 are all about being healthy. And I believe in this room there's people that if you were to be honest, you'd say, that's me. In fact, I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass any of you. I'm just, in fact, I want to just put my hand up first before I even get to the altar call. How many of you would say with me, Pastor, you're tired. I'm unhealthy, spiritually, emotionally. Oh, all over the place. Who else? Pastor, that's me. How many of you would say, Pastor, I need to take a Sabbath. I need to rest and refresh. How many of you need refreshment right now? All over the place. I need refreshment. 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 Hmm. Let's pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus. God, there's no doubt that you had something very unique for this service, the second service on this Sunday. God, you wanted to send a spirit of peace because we need it. God, I believe there's people here at the sound of my voice that, God, we just need refreshment also. God, we've gotten ourselves in a place that maybe we haven't taken the time to reflect and refresh. God, I believe that today you're drawing us to that place. Father, those that raised their hand with me and said, said with, that they need that refreshment, Lord, I pray for that. I pray right now that, God, you would refresh us, that you would draw us into your presence, that you would take us to a place to where we can spend that quality time with you, that we can spend that time for you to speak into our hearts, that you can challenge and provoke us, that, God, you will open our eyes to see where we're really at and open up our ears to, to hear your voice and to respond to what needs to be responded to, that, God, you would challenge us today to find refreshment in you and you alone. God, we need you and only you.